Oh, howdy all, grab yourself a drink, it is time for some Path of Exile discussion. In about two and a half days time, the Krangled Passives event is going to be going live. This video, I wanted to outline my preliminary thoughts on what I would suggest doing if you want to play in this event. This is going to be looking both at people who are going to go hard in the event, but also people who just want to play around and have a bit of fun in an environment that's way different to the base game of Path of Exile. If you want some more information on what the Krangled event is, I'll put a link down to Grinding Gear Games' official announcement down in the description below. But basically, it's a seven day event where the game mostly runs according to the softcore rule set in either trade enabled or in solo self found, your choice. But the death penalty is five times higher. And then we have the major unique thing of this event, which is that the passive tree is going to be scrambled. Every small node on the tree is going to be swapped with other small nodes. Every notable node is going to be swapped with other notables. Every keystone is going to be swapped with other keystones. Also, the same is going to apply to ascendancies, and the ascendancies will be scrambled amongst each other. For example, you might find the Occultus Profane Bloom node in the first of the Frenzy Charge nodes on the radar. This is going to mean a less cohesive and less powerful passive tree, but also an interesting new build challenge for people to play around with in this league. Now, my key assumptions in this video are that this is being run mostly similar to the March events. And that means that the character passive tree will be the same for all players, and that the Atlas passive tree is not going to be crangled, although the passive tree for character power is going to be crangled. If either of these assumptions turns out to be wrong, then some parts of this video will also be wrong. Now, let's talk quickly about the reasons people are going to play this event, because that's going to impact your strategy going into it. Firstly, there's going to be people who are playing because they want something that is Path of Exile, but different. They want some variants from the base game, they just want to have a bit of fun playing around with weird and wonderful character builds that can't exist in the normal game. The second thing will be personal competitive goals people set for themselves. For example, someone might say, I want to be top 500 by XP. Another person might say, I want to defeat Uber Chayula during this event. The third reason people might play, and I actually want to dissuade you from playing if this is your only reason, if you don't think the event sounds like fun, but there'll be people who go into it chasing the microtransaction prizes that are awarded to a random selection of players who reach various level thresholds, and also the mystery box that you definitely get if you hit level 50. On the mystery boxes, they're just not that good a prize unless you happen to want almost everything in them, and on the armor sets that are being offered, you've got a pretty small chance of winning any of them, particularly because the top 25,000, maybe even 50,000 players in Path of Exile have just gotten really, really good at the game over the last few years, and this means that there will be a lot of level 95s by the end of this event. The fourth reason I can see that players will play this event is to transfer wealth that they acquire during this event, because it's a league start-like environment, over to Ancestor Softcore. I expect these players will use league start wealth strategies with a focus on Rog, Blight and Delirium, but of course people will come up with their own variants here. The key thing is that these people are going to be trading for items like 7 years bad luck that aren't very useful in the context of the Krangle Passives event, but that have a lot of value over an Ancestor Softcore. And as a result, if you're playing in the trade enabled version, those people are going to have a pretty big impact on the way the entire economy of the league feels. Finally, there'll be the people who are competing in the top 10 race. Now, if you're playing in the trade enabled version, these people are going to be trading aggressively for items like flawless breach stones or even regular breach stones, all sorts of just XP in a can items that you can get. These people are going to desperately want these and they'll trade well for them. Alternately, if you're in solo self found and you're going hard in the top 10 race, then you're going to need to be playing efficiently and also very, very safely because the death penalty is higher than it is in the standard game. There are two major meta things that we can be sure of about the upcoming Krangle event. The first one is that attributes will be tight. Players are going to need to get more attributes on gear than they normally can. If you've ever tried to fit a gem level 21 determination onto a right side of the passive tree build, you'll know that it takes a fair bit of investment in strength. Deliberate investment you have to go out of your way in order to get, in order to be able to meet the pretty high strength requirement of the determination gem. That is going to be the case for pretty much all characters for all gems in the Krangled event. For this reason, if you're undecided between two skills, I would suggest that you consider ones that have a hybrid of two attribute requirements. For example, Seismic Trap requires both Dexterity and Intelligence, whereas Toxic Rain requires only Dexterity. But because Seismic Trap requires two attributes, the individual attribute requirements are a bit lower, and it ends up being easier to meet than it is to meet the requirements for Toxic Rain. If in doubt, pick a base skill that has these hybrid attribute requirements, because they'll be easier to meet, and if in doubt, consider at least early on using support gems that have hybrid requirements as well. 
in the base game, you get a lot of attributes for free by pathing your tree. So 10 attribute nodes are called travel nodes in the base game for a reason. They are considered complete and utter rubbish that you take because they're on your way. In the Krangled event, you're going to find that a lot of those are going to be scattered to the wind and you're just not going to get them by accident. So attributes are going to be tight even before you consider tattoos and I don't think many players, except at the very top end of character power during the event, will be able to fit many tattoos on their build. Lastly, let's talk Astramentus. Astramentus is too rare for most people to realistically farm during this event. I believe this to be a tier 2 rarity unique, I don't believe tier 1 has been ruled out on it, and its divination card is approximately 8 times rarer than the divination card The Fortunate. So, if you've got a bit of a sense as to how long it takes to self-compile two complete sets of The Fortunate, that's how long it's going to take you to compile one set of the Polymath in order to get yourself an Astramentus. I would not consider this a realistic goal until you hit at least level 93 in this event, and maybe quite a bit later than that. Of course, if you're playing in Trade Enabled, you can always try and source Astramentus through Trade. It will solve all of your attribute issues for you in one fell swoop, but of course it has a very, very high opportunity cost because the amulet slot is extremely good. I will leave it up to you to decide whether it's worth it or not. The second meta point that I want to make is that cluster jewels are going to be dominant in this event. The opportunity cost of using cluster jewels in the base game is that you have to give up a few base tree clusters that you might have otherwise wanted. Often it's worth using a cluster jewel because they do meet this opportunity cost, they are balanced against it, but the cost is real. In the Krangle Passives event though, the passives you want are going to be scattered to the winds, and this means that the classic tree is at a lower power than it is in the base game, but Cluster Jewels are going to be at their full power. In fact, I think that Cluster Jewels are going to be so solid that you would even consider using a scoured Cluster Jewel in this event, because it will just provide you with a large amount of stats that you need. Of course, it is very, very, very easy to roll something that is meaningfully better than a scoured Cluster Jewel. Another point that's important to make here is that this is a potential solution to all the problems we were talking about before with attributes. You've got to get those attributes somewhere, and Cluster Jewels, while they're not an amazing place for it, they are a place that you can reliably roll them. Whilst in the base game, players usually only want attributes on their Cluster Jewel if they're playing a stat stacker build, I do think that's not going to be the case in the Krangle Passives event. In the Krangle Passives event, you must get your attributes somewhere, and one of the good places to do so is going to be on Cluster Jewels, because you are definitely using them anyway. Finally, you're probably going to want to use 12, 6, and 3 passive clusters if you can acquire them, but any old trash will do. If the only cluster jewel you can afford is a 9 passive one, then use that for now. I think there'll be some very interesting cluster jewels that are crafted for this event. A final point, small life clusters are not something that people use a large amount in the base game, and that's because there's plenty of life clusters on the classic passive tree. In this event, all the life notables will still exist, all the life small nodes will still exist, but they're not going to be near each other, and I can't see a lot of people being willing to take an entire four-point cluster if the primary thing that they get out of it is Cruel Preparation, which is a solid but not spectacular life node, and then three small nodes that are just marginal, or potentially do absolutely nothing for their build. Instead, you're going to want to use small life clusters on a lot of builds in this event. The next thing I want to talk about is how this event is going to change as more and more information comes online. For the first 8 hours or so, we'll be in a phase that I'm going to term Initial Exploration. I'm not sure it's going to be 8 hours, that's a guess, but during this phase, the tree is mostly going to be unknown. There'll be reports on Reddit, which are probably going to be 90% true, 10% false, that certain nodes are in certain places on the passive tree. This is going to be the period where character power is going to be at its lowest during the entire event. I'm calling the second phase of the event refinement. During this period, which I'm guessing is going to go for the next 24 hours, so from 8 to 32 hours into the event, although it could be a bit wrong on that timeline, the tree is mostly going to be known, but optimization will not yet be close to complete. So people are going to keep thinking of ways to make characters that are far better than they were during the initial exploration phase, but things aren't going to be all that perfect yet. And then for the last 80% or so of the event, we're going to know everything about the event. It's all going to be about optimizing, and it's going to be about executing whatever plans you happen to have. Now, if your goal is to get into the top 10 in this event, you need to make a very important decision. When is your reroll cut off? You may discover during the refinement phase that the base class that you picked was wrong. For example, you could imagine a world where the Gladiator has the Occultist Profane Bloom, has the Elementalist Shaper of Flame, and also has a Champion Aura Node. If all three of those are on the same Ascendancy, then I would expect that everyone who wants to win will be considering either respecking into that Ascendancy or rerolling a new character on the base class of that Ascendancy. 
you'll need to make a decision when your reroll cutoff is. If your reroll takes place early enough, you'll find that the increased speed that you get more than compensates for the time that you lost playing your first character. On the flip side, if you reroll too late, all of the increased speed that you get from the additional power of whatever stack descendancy it ends up being won't be enough to warrant all of the time that you lost, and you would have been better if you'd stayed on your existing character. Of course, this only really matters if your goal is to go for the top 10. Otherwise, I would say just stick with what's the most fun, which for some people will be sticking with whatever they start with, and for other people is going to be jumping over to whatever the new hotness ends up being. My first impression is that it's probably five hours into the event, and in a lot of ways this gives a bit of a competitive advantage to those who play from Europe or Africa, or areas with a similar sort of time zone. And the reason for that is that those people can go to sleep on Friday night, set an alarm for five or six hours after the event starts, and then when they start, they'll already know what the best ascendancy is going to be, so they can avoid all of the messing around. Of course, for those of us that are playing because the initial exploration phase is going to be fun, well, if you're in that situation and you're in those time zones, it's a bit less fortunate. Now, I wanted to continue looking at the phases the event's going to go through. This is going to have a look at items, but with a focus on Trade League, because if you're playing in Solo Self Found, it doesn't really matter what other players have got at that point, it's about what your next upgrade is. But if you're playing in Trade League, things are going to improve fast. Day 1, almost no Tier 0, Tier 1, and Tier 2 uniques exist. Tier 3 uniques are going to be scarce, rares are going to be bad. This is kind of the way that it is in a normal league start as well, but things will be a bit slower because there'll be a smaller player base than a new league start, and there will also be less character power. Builds that can defeat milestone bosses on dumpster gear shine incredibly bright on this day. Whether that be the Maven, whether it even be the Black Star, Black Star will be something that I think a lot of people will have problems with in this event. Those builds are going to be really bright shiners if you're playing in Trade League. Days 2 to 4, you start seeing rarer uniques exist, but they're scarce, and they're somewhat monopolised by the people who had a good day 1, because those people have the currency to throw around in order to pick up those rarer uniques. Tier 3s become pretty accessible, so this means if you want a Heat Shiver, don't count on getting it day 1, but you will definitely get it day 2 or 3 or 4 if you play a moderate amount. Rares start getting better at this point, and most players are still prioritising their success within the event, which means unlocking their atlas, building a bit of a scarab pool, and so on and so forth. Now days 5 to 7, I'm expecting there to be quite a big change. As we get to the last few days of the event, more and more people are going to be quitting the event. Sometimes this will be because they decide they've just had enough of it. Sometimes it'll be because they feel like they can't make the next progression milestone that they've set for themselves. They've achieved their last achievable goal for the event. And sometimes it's going to be because they just run out of time. Maybe someone works Wednesdays, Thursdays and Fridays, and as a result, they just don't have the time to dedicate to the event. Now, among those players, some of them are just going to let their characters go to Ancestor Softcore as is, but other people are going to try to maximise the amount of wealth that they take with them. For example, they might start trading all the gear that makes up their character for as many copies of the Divination card 7 years bad luck as they can afford, or other pieces of mirrors, like the Divination card, The Immortal. Or they might try and pick up other things that people really want in trade leagues, like Yellow Harvest Goo, Maven's Ritz, and the like. During this phase, these people who are exiting the economy are going to dominate the league economy, and that's important to be aware of. It means that if you do want to use this event to pick up wealth in Ancestor Softcore, you probably want to do it before people start quitting the event en masse, which means you want to start doing it days 3 and 4. Start converting your wealth into fractions of mirrors, start converting it into other things that have more value in a long-term trade league than they do in a short-term event like this. Now, if you are not interested in accumulating wealth in Ancestor Softcore, this is also going to have a bit of an impact on you, because it's going to mean that if you do come across a drop like 7 Years Bad Luck, that you'll probably be able to get a lot more for it in this event if you hold on to it towards the end, you'll then be able to potentially trade it for some very powerful gear that's easily required in Ancestor Softcore, but that might be much more difficult to acquire in a temporary event like this league. Let's talk next about build selection. Firstly, I want to ask the question, should you aim to scale your character's power through gem levels or through weapon scaling? Now in the base game, gem level scaling is just superior days 1 to 3. It is much easier to get a near endgame gem, i.e. a level 21 gem without quality, than it is to get a near endgame weapon. By day 4, a small number of very good weapons exist, but they're only affordable to players who really efficiently farmed days 1 to 3. And this means those weapons are mostly going to be available to people who did gem level scaling early. 
For that reason, I want to recommend that you start with a skill that is gem level scaling. Now there are a few things that mass produce good weapons. Rog and Heist come to mind. Rog creates very good weapons and Heist drops them from Curios in Enchanted Armaments Heist. Enchanted Armaments Heist may not be that popular in a mature trade league, but they are really, really good at league start. Now players are going to do less expedition and more heist in this event I expect due to the mechanics relative safety and how difficult they are on a low power character. But those players who are doing expedition will do extremely well because they'll be able to create some of these early weapons. All that said, I still recommend that you build around gem level scaling because level 20 gems and level 21 gems are pretty easy to come by very early in the league and they're just good enough to do all content in the game in a way that a 300 DPS physical sword is not really good enough to do all that much content. The next build question I want to look at is do you go tanky, do you go glass cannon, or do you go some hybrid of the two? I don't think you're going to be able to pull together a really tanky character with the Krangle tree. The tools that you need to make one will be too spread out all over the tree. Glass cannon with cast on death portal will fall off maybe around level 83, 84, 85, and that's because of the higher death XP penalty. For that reason, I think that hybrid is going to be the way to go in this event. Defense from auras, clusters, items, but not really from the classic passive tree because all of the defensive nodes are going to be scattered to the winds. And you'll find you have things like evasion passives, next to armor passives, next to life passives, next to energy shield passives, next to spell block passives. All of these things that don't really synergize with each other, even though they're individually good stats if you can get a lot of them. The main thing I think you're going to want to do though is take a leaf out of hardcore players books and roll your maps conservatively. The most dangerous thing in modern Path of Exile tends to be map mods, and as a result, less of them is going to be safer. If you're looking to get as much XP as possible, I think what you're going to want to do is run a lot of two mod magic maps, or potentially really conservatively rolled rare maps. Don't run eight mod maps, except maybe when you've just dinged a level. And remember that while two mod maps do impact your map sustain, if you spec a bit into map sustain on the passive tree, you won't have any real problems with that. I should just clarify though that this only applies once you've set your atlas up. While you're setting up your atlas, it's perfectly fine to val your maps, take a few deaths while you're building up your atlas passives, but once you've got them set up, then at that point you probably want to stop dying. The next build question I want to ask is do you want to play instant damage, damage over time, or damage through a proxy? When I'm talking about damage through a proxy, I mean things like totems, traps, mines, anything where you are not the origin of the damage. I'll start by thinking about brands. Here, I feel like Runebinder might be too far away from brand masteries for me to be able to recommend these builds. Totems come next, and Vile Ancestral Warchief Flamewood builds might be S tier for bossing, because most totem life is kind of scattered on the regular passive tree anyway. Ancestor totem attack builds might work with a Krangle tree, but I do think that native spell totems, so things like Holy Flame totem, and spell totem support builds are much more dependent upon Ancestral Bond, and I think they may be much worse than they are in the base game. That said, I definitely think Flamewood is at least worth investigating during this event. Now minions come next, and I think that these are probably going to be bad as the important stuff on the passive tree for minions, there's a lot of it, and it's going to be scattered to the winds during this event. But do keep an eye out, maybe one of the ascendancies will be really, really stacked with minion stuff, and if that's the case, then I'm willing to reassess my thoughts on minions. For traps and mines, most trap and mine builds are very heavily reliant upon critical strikes. We'll get to why I don't think critical strike builds are going to be good in this in a sec, but do keep in mind that there are poison versions of trap and mine builds, and I do think that those are going to be better. In fact, I'm probably going to be playing a physical poison trapper, and I think that this is going to be one of the more meta builds in this event. So let's talk critical strikes. I think critical strikes are going to be hard to pull off in general. In the normal game, without the Krangle Tree modifier, there's a synergy involving base tree critical clusters granting you both critical strike multiplier and critical strike chance together in the same cluster. This is really important because you need to have both stats for either of them to become good. Now in the Krangle Tree world, you're not going to have clusters where there's a good critical strike multiplier node that is the focal point of the node that's a notable, and then the small nodes that are leading up to it are going to be things like 25% increased critical strike chance that then provides you that critical strike chance necessary for that multiplier to be good. You will still find that you'll get some clusters that have notables with critical strike multiplier on them, but they're going to be missing that context that makes them good in the base game. It's probably going to be possible to pull off a critical strike build, especially using some of the medium cluster jewels for critical strikes, but I think this is going to be very difficult to do well. Now damage over time is balanced against critical strike based instant damage in the base game, 
It generally is worse than critical strike based instant damage, but it does have its own unique advantages as well. For that reason, I feel like damage over time is better than non-critical strike based instant damage builds, which I'm also not going to recommend in this event. Damage over time is likely to end up with the right tools, although we're going to need to find out where all of the different dot multi nodes are scattered across the tree. But it is poison that has jumped out at me as the thing that I think has the most potential in this event. And that's because it can scale off a lot of different stats. And it's also in a pretty strong spot in the base game as well. The next thing you want to consider when it comes to builds is the symmetry or asymmetry of the classic passive tree. And you want to have a look and see, are any of the base classes clearly ahead just due to having more options or better pathing? And one of the things you'll notice if you look into this is that some of the ascendancies have more notables than others. For example, there are eight notables in the Saboteur, the Chieftain, the Hierophant, and the Deadeye. More options is likely to be better, but not absolutely guaranteed, because you might wind up with some of these being things that don't really achieve anything on their own. The other thing of note is that the Witch starting area is stacked with more notables than the rest of the tree is, and that means that there's more chance for those notables to be good. Now this doesn't guarantee that these ascendancies or that the Witch class are going to be better than other options, it just means that they have more chance to be good. Let's talk quickly about the Atlas for the event. Now this is a race to get as much XP as possible, at least if you're focused on the competitive aspect, but currency is going to help a lot when it comes to that. I expect that the top 6 in the trade enabled version of this event may well end up going to the first high end cohesive group that happens to get a miracle headhunter drop. Or alternatively, maybe they don't get a headhunter to drop for them, but they get something massive, a mirror of Calandra, a mage blood, etc that they're able to trade for the first headhunter that goes up for trade. Once they've got that headhunter, they can then farm five ways and four ways, which are the best source of XP in the game still, despite the nerf that they got in 3.22. And they can also farm these for loot as well, because these do drop quite a bit of loot, especially very early on in a league, that they can then trade for more emblems. Essentially, the first group that ends up with a headhunter will end up in somewhat of a virtuous cycle of currency for themselves, and that's going to propel them into a bigger and bigger lead. Now, on the flip side though, you might be playing solo, and this could be solo in a competitive sense in the solo self-found environment, or it might just be that you are not that interested in trading aggressively and cooperating with other players in order to boost yourself up the ladder. In that situation, I think that the best strategy is probably going to be to spec hard into Abyss in this event. That's because Abyss is relatively easy, at least alongside easy map mods, and when characters are weak, Abyss and a map sustain atlas allow running transmuted maps, getting map returns from them because the Abysses are adding so many monsters to each map, and also Abyss just gives so much XP it is not funny. Betrayal is also worth your while considering, and I think that for a lot of people, one of the first sets of points you should spend on your atlas passive tree when you're setting it up is going to be the early node that gives a boost to the percentage chance of getting a Jun mission when you complete a map. The reason for this is that Jun missions provide an enormous amount of XP, and this remains a really good boost of XP when the map is rolled conservatively. So in conclusion, if you're looking to get XP solo, the Atlas strategy that I would default towards is throwing a whole bunch of Abysses onto your maps, throwing Betrayal onto your maps, and running reasonably easily rolled maps that don't have very many mods on them. So in the absence of knowing how the Krangle Tree is going to work out, I think that the best build to start with is going to be Physical, Poison, Mines and or Traps. Which version of this you want to run is entirely up to you. You could go Exsanguinate Mines, Reap Mines, you could go Seismic Trap. I'd be inclined to go Seismic Trap as your main skill, Exsanguinate in Deerstalker once you're able to get your hands on that item as your secondary skill, and potentially you could use Reap in Mines as well for a little bit of extra damage. Now this build can function without passives at all. Every useful passive that you get is a bonus. Colon Point is a tier 3 rarity unique that you can pick up in trade, or worst case scenario, through target farming Jorgen in Betrayal. Now, there's a divination card called Broken Truce that's an uncommon drop from Jorgen in Betrayal. It's not truly rare. As a result, it's something you can slowly start working on from the end of Act 9, but really it's something you start working on for real once you get into the Atlas, and your first points on your Atlas tree would be increased chance of getting a Jun mission, once you've got that, you work on your entire atlas, getting yourself a whole bunch of extra character power and also getting your atlas better. But while you're doing this, you're also going to be passively generating Jun missions. And once you start reaching a bit of a brick wall in character power, then you can work on getting those broken truce drops from Jorgen. So you have a lot of different options there. Additionally, Betrayal is just a really good source of early rare items in general. Once you just get into maps, you'll find that the Veiled items are better on average than a rare on the ground by quite a lot. And as a result, while they're not perfect, 
they can be a bit of a power boost when you get them. Key items you're going to want if you want to try out this build is going to be Coline Point times 2 if at all possible, Exsanguinate Boots, i.e. Deerstalker. You're going to want Spell Suppression Gear and the Lucky Suppression Mastery if you're anywhere near it. The Mastery to make Spell Suppression Lucky is something that you tend to outgear in the base game pretty quickly. And that's because in the base game you can reliably get a fair bit of Spell Suppression from the classic passive tree and you can get the rest of it from your gear. However, in this event you're only going to reliably have access to the suppression that you get from gear. Spell Suppression is still a really, really strong defensive layer, but you're very unlikely to get 100% on gear. That's going to mean that you're more likely to be in the 40, 50, 60% range, or even 30 or 70%, where the Spell Suppression is Lucky Mastery is incredibly, incredibly good. So essentially, it's going to be much better in this event than it is in the base game, and it's something you should definitely take and probably keep for the entire event. Other than that, the main thing you want on this character is gem XP. You want lots and lots of gem XP, because that's going to be where a lot of your damage is going to come from. Anyways, I wanted to conclude with two final points. Rule 1, have fun. And Rule 2, if you're not succeeding at Rule 1, take a break. This event should be fun, it should be a fresh way to play the game, it should not be a miserable grind. If you do find that it is a miserable grind, then you can just safely conclude this event's not for you, and go and do something else with your week. Having got that out of the way, I'm going to leave it here. May your passive tree be crangled in interesting ways.